over the past few weeks, we've been asking the question, what kind of church is Jesus building? Three weeks ago, Pastor Cliff asked, what do we rely on to build the church? And two weeks ago, Pastor Steve asked the question, what evidence do we see when Jesus built his church? And it's very really clear that the builder of the church is Jesus. It's his church, and he makes the choices. He's the architect, he's the interior designer, and he's the builder. You know, he even does the quantities of in. It's his church. He builds it. Matthew 16, 18, it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And tonight at Stockton, for those of you who are coming along to Stockton, I'm really going to dig into that verse tonight. What does Jesus mean when he says that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not stand against it? But this morning I want to ask the question, if Jesus is building the church, what's he building it with? What material does Jesus use to build his church? See, we're not talking about church as a building. Church isn't a building. It's a community. And a community is built of people. Communities aren't made of bricks or mortar or steel girders. That's not the kind of material Jesus uses to build his church. It's us. It's people. And when people see the church, what they see is the people. Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. I'm just going to read from there. And this is what I'm going to base my message on this morning. Matthew 5. 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing then to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, Jesus tells us that it's us that he's using. We are the salt that stops this earth going bad. We are the light, that city on a hill, and Jesus wants us to shine. Jesus will build his church. And it's people that he will use. He wants our lights to be seen. He wants our good works to be seen so that people will see God through us and will glorify the Father in heaven. I wonder this morning, are you prepared to be a brick? Do we have many bricks here this morning? Are you prepared to be used in the church that Jesus is building? I will ask the question, what kind of bricks is Jesus looking for in us? I wonder this morning, have you ever felt that God can't use you? Have you ever felt that perhaps you're not good enough? Or maybe you know God can use you because after all, he's God. But perhaps all your mistakes, all your failings, all your weaknesses, Perhaps you feel that even though God can use you, God doesn't want to use you because you've messed up too many times. Well, congratulations if you feel like that because you're in good company. The church is built out of weak stones, weak people, people who fail, people who don't understand, people who get it wrong, people who make mistakes and people who are generally quite messed up. And I feel in good company when I say that. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame to the things that are mighty. And I love that verse because I feel very included in that verse. God can use me. It seems I meet both of the requirements laid down. I'm weak and I'm foolish. I'm in. You know, we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. 
And we are all, every single person in this room, is somebody who has a weakness. But that does not mean God will not use you. Anyone God has ever used has been messed up. Because anyone God has ever used has been a human being. If you just look through the Bible, hear the types of people that God used to change the world. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was far too old to have children. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar and a manipulator. Joseph was abused and sold into slavery. Moses had a stuttering problem and he was a murdering fugitive. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were both too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Isaiah preached naked. Be glad we don't still do that. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. I'm sorry if I've put a horrible image in everybody's head there. <laughs> Peter denied Christ three times in one night. The disciples fell asleep while they were praying. Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons. Zacchaeus was small and dishonest. Paul was too religious. And Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. And God used each and every one of these people for his glory. Every single one of these people had major issues in their life. And I can't think that any of us here can top that list. <coughs> but every single one was powerfully used by God. So much so that we still talk about them today. You know, Charles Spurgeon is one of the greatest preachers that this country has ever seen. Perhaps the world has ever seen. So much so we know him by his title, The Prince of Preachers. Perhaps what's less known about Spurgeon is that Spurgeon suffered from depression. Badly. So much so that there was one meeting he was at where somebody who was trying to cause a problem caused a riot and there was a stampede in the meeting of people thinking that the building was on fire and people were crushed underfoot and died. Spurgeon got so depressed about it he couldn't preach for over six months. Spurgeon suffered from depression. See, I take great encouragement to know that somebody I admire so much struggles with the things I struggle with. Evan Roberts, the guy who was at the very center of the Welsh revival, afterwards suffered from a massive depression because he couldn't cope with what was going on. Thousands were saved, yet Evan Roberts was still depressed. We're far from perfect. You know, even as a church, we are far from perfect, aren't we? Sometimes we even fail to live up to our own ideals. You know, even that message on front of our church, where you're a stranger only once, let's be honest, sometimes it's not true of us, is it? Sometimes you're sick and nobody calls. Sometimes you're going through stuff and people aren't there for you. Why? Because we don't believe that? No, because we're people and we get it wrong. And forgive us. Every single one of us gets it wrong. I wonder, have you ever felt you're not good enough? Or you're not ready for God to use you yet? Then welcome to the club. Do you think God could do better than you? Great. You're just the kind of person God's looking for. See, when we feel weak, he can bring us strength. He sees the potential that's in us because he put it there. See, on our own, we might not be good enough to get the job done, but it's in God's power. It's God's power in us that makes the difference. 
Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power that's at work within us. He can do work in us more than we can imagine, more than we can think, and more than we could ask. He can do things with us that we could never imagine, not because we are strong and powerful, but because he is strong and powerful. Weak people understand that it's not their strength that they're relying on, but it's him. He who knows us better than we know ourselves. See, sometimes it's very easy to forget he made us. Every single one of us. Yes, he made us as a race, but he made Kevin. He made Hazel. He made Irene. He made all of us individually. You know, one of my favorite parts of the Bible is Psalm 139. Especially verses 16, sorry, 13 to 16. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me. Even as yet, there was none of them. He knows us that well. He knows our inward parts. He knows the potential that we have. And he knows exactly what that potential is capable of because he put it there. And he put it there for a purpose. You know, he wrote down the days of your life before there was any days in your life. See, we struggle to see past our doubts. We struggle to see past our mistakes and our weaknesses. But he can see straight through all of that to the potential he gave us. <coughs> God can use you to your full potential. And besides, we're not the message. We're just the messengers. I tell you this, and this is the truth. There is not a single person in this church right now that God can't use. Not a single person. And anyone who's even listening on the podcast, there's not a single one of them that God can't use. Every person who's here is this, God can use you. You might not believe that, but it's true. He is stronger than your weakness. He is bigger than your lack. And his vision is far more powerful than your short-sightedness. No matter what your hang-ups, God can use you. Just look at the people that Jesus put around him, his disciples. They got it wrong so often. You know, Jesus at one point gets so frustrated, he actually says, How long do I have to put up with you guys? You know, these guys were not the best of the best. They weren't scholars. They weren't warriors. They weren't the brightest. They were a strange collection of people to put together. Some of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. A guy who collected money from the Jews and gave it to the Romans. Also in the group were zealots. Freedom fighters who hated the Romans. Can you imagine how they got on with Matthew? Can you imagine when they first met? Who would put these people together? Yet Jesus took this strange group who would never normally get on. And they achieved great things for God. I think that's a beautiful picture of church. People who would never normally come across each other. People who would never in the natural, find something in common. Coming together with one mission. Now this raises a big question, of course. If God can use everyone, why does God not use everyone? 
If he can use anyone, why doesn't he use everyone? Why is it that some people are not used by God? It's not our weakness. Because it's his strength. So why do so many Christians spend their lives not achieving anything for God and struggling so much? You see, we all make the grade. We're all messed up people, so there must be more than that that God is looking for when he's looking for people to build the church with. So the first thing is, God uses messed up people. Everyone God uses is messed up. But everybody God uses has something else in common too. <coughs> what qualified the disciples? It wasn't a degree. It wasn't training. All of them, Jesus speaks to them and says, come, follow me. And their response is, yes. Everyone who God uses needs to say yes. They need to be willing to obey his call. See, Jesus builds with material that is willing to be molded into what he wants that material to be. See, that's the difference between people Jesus uses to build the church and the people he doesn't. Those who are hard of heart or are not willing to be used, those are the people Jesus won't use. That's not to say he can't, but he won't. God is looking for people who are willing to be obedient to his will. Whatever that might mean. I wonder this morning, is that you? Are you willing to be obedient to whatever it is he wants you to do? If God asks you to do something, are you ready and willing to do it? See, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for our obedience. You know, God wants our obedience more than anything. Because complete obedience to his will opens up the plans and the purpose that he has for you. Why did God test Abraham with that sacrifice of his son? Is it because God's cruel? No. It's because of the responsibility that was to be laid upon Abraham. He needed to prove his obedience. All of the letters of Paul are filled with calls to obedience. It's our obedience that shows the world the way to God. That's what makes us a light. That's what makes us shine. That's what makes us that city on a hill. It's when we obey him. <coughs> and today, sadly, less and less, we don't teach and preach obedience. We teach grace and tolerance, which is right. But we cannot let those things mean that we sacrifice our obedience on the altar of grace. Right throughout the Bible, we see people who are great men and women of God marked by this feature. Isaiah 6, 8. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. God asks who will go. What's your response this morning? Send somebody else. Use him. Or he said, God, I'm here. Send me. Use me. See, that's the sort of material that Jesus uses to build the church. You know, Moses said when God asked him to go, but I'm short of tongue. I can't speak properly. But then he put it to one side. And he went, and a nation was freed. Pick any figure from Scripture, and it's in the times that they were obedient to God that God uses them. King Saul was used by God for great victories until he disobeyed God. Then all of his achievements stopped, and a stalemate was reached until David came along. Jonah was not used by God until he was obedient. And boy, did God pursue Jonah until he was obedient. But when Jonah turned his heart back to God, and Jonah is obedient, an entire city gives their lives to God. 
Samson, he judged Israel for 20 years. We forget sometimes. We just hear about the bad stuff. 20 years he judged Israel in obedience before he met Delilah. And then he lost all of his strength. And he only regained it in those final moments when he cried out, God, let me die with the Philistines. It was only in that moment where he put God back in charge of his life that he dealt them a bigger blow than he had in his entire life. Even Jesus, God made flesh, showed ultimate obedience to the Father. He said, not my will, but yours. Let me tell you, none of us this morning are above Jesus. We've got no less reason to be obedient. John 5, 19, it says, Then Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but just what he sees the Father do. For what he does, the Son does in like manner. I wonder if we really relied on God that much, that we do nothing of ourselves, but only what we see the Father do. Our lives, our church, our town, and our area will be completely different places. See, God isn't looking for obedience because he's got control issues. But because a life and obedience in him can change the world. A life in disobedience is a life in sin. And it blocks God's will. You won't go where he wants you. You won't do what he wants you to do. I wonder this morning, what sort of person are you? Are you someone who's willing to obey? Do you hear that still, small voice and, and go for it? Or do you ignore his promptings and put it down and think, somebody else can do that? Or about when you're reading the Bible and the Bible challenges you? Are you the sort of person who thinks, Lord, I've got to change? I've got to change. Or do you think, it's okay. I'll be fine. I'll come back to that at a later date. See, often obedience doesn't actually start with the big, scary steps. It starts with the little things, the little obedience. It's when we're trusted with the small, we're trusted with the great. Luke 16, 10, it says, He who was faithful, he that is faithful in that which is least, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least, is also unjust in much. Now I understand none of us are perfect in our obedience to God. None of us. We just talked about that a few minutes ago. We all mess up. We all get it wrong. And there's a certain amount of tension here between obedience and getting it wrong. I understand there's always going to be this tension because we're imperfect people. But I cannot get away from the connection between obedience levels and the levels of what God's willing to do with us. You know, the parable of the talent is a great example of this. I'm Matthew 25, 14 to 30. I'm just going to read the whole thing. But I think this is a great example of this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. See, he already gives out according to their own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And when he had received, then he had received five talents, went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Look, Lord, I delivered to you five talents. And I gained five more besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he who'd received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. And the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
When he who received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. And the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my, monkey, my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received my own back with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten. Faithfulness in the small leads to faithfulness in the big. Now, this applies to money, as it does here. It also applies to your gifting. But it's more than that. It's a matter of obedience. See, that wicked servant, he wasn't just lazy, he was disobedient to what was expected of him. And you see this in people today. Those who have done great things for God started off doing small things for God. You know, at the men's breakfast we've been watching over the last few months, the story of Reinhard Bonnke. And I don't know about anybody else, I found it inspiring. You know, right at the start, He didn't start with these amazing revival meetings with over a million people. That might be a surprise. That's not how it began. It didn't even start with the hundreds or the thousands. It started with small steps that to him at the time were huge steps. It started with obedience even when everybody told him he was hearing God wrong. It started with, over- <coughs> with overcoming disappointment when it looked like he'd failed and got it wrong. See, obedience in the small leads to the chance of experiencing obedience in the big. And I believe that's true of everybody. It's true of this church. If we're obedient to his will, if we take steps of faith into the things that are scary, he is able to do more than we could ever imagine with that. Those who are faithful in tongues find themselves open to prophecies. Those who pray for the sick earnestly open themselves up to experience healings. What are you doing with the gifts God has given you? Has given you? Are you putting them under a rock? Or are you getting out there and taking a risk? Because it is a risk. You may tell those first two servants both took a risk. They could have invested that money and lost it. That man with ten talents, he could have invested it and never seen anything back. He could have lost all ten. Are we taking risks? with what God's given us. See, if we're disobedient as a church, I believe we're finished. We're done. It's not a question of how much we want to see revival in this area. And we might want it. We might want it so much, but let me tell you, wanting revival is not enough. It's not just a question of wanting it. See, we live in a culture today where wanting something seems to be all it takes to get something. You watch X Factor or any of those programs. And when the host asks the person, tell the people at home why they should vote for you. All of them say this. I just want this so much. I really, really want this. As if that's enough. Wanting it's not enough. You've got to be good. Wanting it and no obedience doesn't cut it. And I tell you, this is becoming more and more of an issue today where if we just want something enough, we believe it will happen. That's the great American lie. If you want it enough, it'll happen. It's not true. You know, when a well-known minister falls today or their ministry crumbles, in most cases, it's because of disobedience. Sometimes it's not following the will of God for that ministry. Sometimes it's less subtle than that, and it's sin. 
And here's the problem. We're developing a culture today where ministers who wanted enough are allowed back in after sin without second thought. Why? Because they really want it. They're really sorry and they really want it. Or because they're gifted in a certain way or in a certain spiritual gift, we let them back, even in some cases when they're still in disobedience. But what we do is we say well, there's a double standard here. If you're gifted, it's allowed. If you're just in the church, it's not allowed. And we create double standards for people who are in ministry because they're good at something. Or because there was a time where the anointing was so strong on them. Let me tell you, disobedience to the will of God is disobedience. And there's a fine line. There's got to be forgiveness. And there must be restoration. You know, we all mess up. None of us are perfect. We all get it wrong. But I find no examples in Scripture of someone who falls into big disobedience with God and then has everything restored to its former glory. I find no examples of that. Now, of course, there must be grace. There's got to be grace. But, but do we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Paul says, by no means. You see, we assume when we run into trouble, when we assume God would rather we're happy than obedient. We assume that God would rather we were happy. And we can justify all manner of sins if that's our assumption. Let me tell you, not that God's not concerned with your happiness, but he'd rather you were obedient than happy. And that's not a popular thing to say. Jesus is looking for an obedient people with which to build his church. I wonder, will he find those people this morning? He's looking for people who will say, here I am, send me. But you know what, even that's not enough. It takes more than willingness to follow the will of God. So the first thing God's looking for is people who are messed up. Amen, that's me. Second thing he's looking for is people who are willing to be obedient. But let me tell you, nobody God has ever used is somebody who did nothing. It's not enough to be willing to be used or to be willing to obey and then do nothing about it. Jesus is looking for people of action. The disciples didn't just say yes to Jesus when he asked them to follow him. They put down their nets. They stopped what they were doing and they followed. And they eventually followed him, a lot of them, to their death. If they'd stayed there fishing, if they'd wanted to follow Jesus but not put down their nets, they wouldn't have changed the world. Jesus would have used somebody else. I wonder this morning, are you ready to put down your nets? Are you ready to stop what you're doing and get on with it? Are we ready to stop and follow where he goes? See, Jesus is looking for people of action. It's more than a willing people, but people who turn that willingness into something. And the problem with many Christians is we're willing, but we don't turn our willingness into action. We procrastinate. We have a dream for a certain ministry that God's given us. Or something we want to accomplish for God. But that's all it ever is, is a dream. Because they do nothing about it. Are you willing to put down your nets? What is it this morning that you've intended to do for God for years? But never actually got started in doing it. See, Moses would not have set his people free unless he went and stood in front of Pharaoh. God did the work, but Moses had to put himself there. No matter how much he desired change. David could have been incensed at Goliath's insults. But that didn't matter until he got up there, picked up the stones and stood in front of him. 
There is nobody in the Bible who achieves something for God by being passive. Nobody. You know, when Luther developed the 95 Theses that would start the whole Protestant church, nothing would have happened until he nailed them to that door. We can be willing, but it takes more than good intentions. Jesus said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Why? Because intentions accomplish nothing. Intentions save nobody. Intentions change no lives. Now I understand not everybody gets a vision for a ministry. Not everybody has this, this burning thing inside them that they believe God's called them to do. Let me tell you, what's a person of action? It's not just somebody who has a call, but it's somebody who supports somebody else's call. A person of action is a person who supports. A person who gives financially. A person who serves. A person of action helps somebody else's vision get realized. And a person of action who has vision is someone who steps out of the board and goes for it. I wonder, when Jesus walked on the water, and those guys were in the boat, how many of the disciples saw him and thought, I want to do that? Because I know me, I'd want to do that. My guess is, they'd all want to do it. It would be amazing. But only one of them got out the board. Only Peter walked on the water because only Peter climbed out the board. The others might have wanted it, but they didn't climb out the board. Peter took that scary step onto the water. And it's scary. It takes faith to step out. And that's kind of the point. You know, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When we step out in faith, what we do is we allow God to take control. We put God in charge. When we do that, there's nothing God can't accomplish through us. I can do all things, not through myself, but through him who strengthens me. Maybe this morning, you've had that desire to step out. You know God can use you. But there's something holding you back. What it takes is a step of faith. Getting out that board. Maybe this morning that might feel like a really hard step for you. But let me tell you, you can't walk anywhere without taking a first step. <coughs> Too often, great ideas, great personal ministries... And great things for God don't happen because the person who God's birthed it in doesn't take any action. We would have no food bank if Kevin hadn't have stepped out when it was scary. We could have had all the intentions in the world. It wouldn't exist. We can always find reasons not to act. There's no support. There's no money. There's no training don't have time for this right now. Let me tell you, when Peter stepped out, the water was wet. The waves were choppy. The danger was real, but Peter still stepped out. I wonder how the others felt about that when that happened. I'm sure the idea of joining Peter would have excited them. But they stayed in the boat. I'm just going to wrap up and we're going to pray. Seagull there again. We're going to wrap up and we're going to pray. What kind of material does Jesus use to build his church? We're going to pray for three groups of people this morning. See, I believe we can break these three things. If we can do that, then there's no limit to what we can achieve, to what this church can achieve. 
If we take this on board, I really believe this morning ministries can be birthed here. This morning can be a catalyst for change in your life. God uses messed up people. Congratulations, that includes you and me. There is nobody in this room that God cannot accomplish great things through. And perhaps this morning, you sit in there and you doubt it. Perhaps you don't feel good enough, or strong enough, or clever enough, or strong enough. You're in good company. None of us do. Have you got that feeling of inadequacy that's held you back in doing something for God? God uses messed up, weak people. You're not an exception to that. God can use anyone in this room to do great things. And if you don't believe that about yourself this morning, then we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that that stranglehold over your life is loosed because it's a lie and it needs to be broken. You are the type of person that Jesus uses. It's not about belief in yourself. It's not about self-actualization or self-esteem. It's about realizing it's not about you. You're not the message. You're just the messenger. You're a vessel. You are a jar of clay, and inside you, there's a treasure hidden. God can use you. And if you don't believe that about yourself this morning, we're going to give an opportunity for you to come forward, and we're going to pray. But it's not just a question of knowing you can be used. It's also looking for people who are obedient. And I want to break this down into two types. First, there are those who are disobedient to the will of God in that you know there's things he's asked you to do, and you've just not done them. God is after your obedience this morning. When you're obedient, then you let him mold you into what he wants you to be. There are people this morning who are probably here, and I believe, fighting the will of God for your life. You need to turn that round if you want to be used. There's people here who God is asking, who shall I send? And your response has always been, send somebody else. We need to break that this morning. We need to be, here am I, send me people. We need to be like those first two servants. and We need to take risks. Not like that unfaithful one. It might be small steps that need to be taken. But it's not until we obey the promptings that something will happen. And I want to pray for you people this morning. But the second type of disobedience is sin. Perhaps you've not had that still small voice. But are you actually obeying what's written in the word of God? Sin can destroy a ministry can also destroy a life. If you're in sin this morning, then that needs dealing with. Not just so God can use you, but because you are running into serious trouble. I wonder this morning, have you let sin get in the way of your calling? Perhaps you're really gifted at something. Perhaps you're really gifted and you've convinced yourself it's okay because you're serving God. Let me tell you, that might continue like that for a while, but it never ends well. How do you deal with that? You've got to repent. You have to put it behind you. It's not just the way that God uses you that's in jeopardy with this one, but everything's in jeopardy. Sin destroys. If that's you this morning, then you need to deal with it. And we'll give you a chance, and we'll pray. And the last thing I want to pray for this morning is I'd say probably the largest group. 
to those of us who, who believe God can use us, those who want to be obedient, but there's something, something just keeps stalling in your life. It's like a car on a winter's day. It's just not getting it. You have vision, you've got ideas, but that's all they are. It's vision and ideas, and that's all it has been for some time now. It's time this morning to be people of action. It's time to get out of that boat. See, here's the thing. I do not believe that it's God will, God's will for anyone to do nothing. I don't believe God tells anybody, do nothing. So either we're not doing anything because we're not hearing His will, or we're not doing anything because we believe He can't use us, or it's because we're in disobedience. Now this might sound harsh, but I really believe that. God has a plan for everyone, and God's plan isn't for anyone to do nothing. Not everybody has a vision, but everybody can be used to support a vision. Maybe you don't have a ministry that God wants to birth through you. Maybe your calling is to serve somebody else's vision or the vision of your church. Serving is action. It's obedience. We're not saved by good works. But we are saved for them. Bless God. We're like a city on a hill, a light to the world. And it's when we step out that people see God. It's through what we do that they can glorify God. Many, in fact, most Christians do not achieve great things for God. It's the truth. Let's be honest, a high percentage of people in churches aren't even willing to serve. And it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. It can only be somebody else's. This morning, do you want to be different? Do you want to step up? If we all step up, then I really believe the church Jesus can build, we can't even imagine what it would be like.